Six of Crows, Chapter 4, Inej. Inej knew the moment Kaz entered the slat. His presence reverberated through the cramped rooms and crooked hallways as every thug, thief, dealer, conman, and stairer came a little more awake. Per Hassel's favorite lieutenant was home. The slat wasn't much, just another house in the worst part of the barrel. Three stories stacked tight on top of each other, crowned with an attic and gabled roof. Most of the buildings in this part of the city had been built without foundations, many on swampy land where canals were haphazardly dug. They leaned against each other like tipsy friends gathered at a bar, tilting at drowsy angles. Inej had visited plenty of them on her errands for the dregs, and they weren't much better on the inside, cold and damp, plaster sliding from the walls, gaps in the windows wide enough to let in rain and snow. But Kaz had spent his own money to have the slats drafts shorn and walls insulated. It was ugly, crooked, and crowded, but the slat was gl gloriously dry. Inej's room was on the third floor, a skinny slice of space barely big enough for a cot and a trunk, but with a window that looked out over the peaked roofs and jumbled chimneys of the barrel. When the wind came through and cleared away the haze of coal smoke that hung over the city, she could even make out a blue pocket of harbor. Though dawn was just a few hours away, the slat was wide awake. The only time the house was ever really quiet was in the slow hours of the afternoon, and tonight everyone was buzzing with the news of the showdown at the exchange, Big Balger's fate, and now poor Rojak's dismissal. Inej had gone straight from her conversation with Kaz to seek out the card dealer at the Crow Club. He'd been at the tables dealing with three men, Bramble for Jesper, and a couple of Rathkin tourists. When he'd finished the hand, Inej had suggested they speak in one of the private gaming parlors to spare him the embarrassment of being fired in front of his friends, but Rojak wasn't having it. It's not fair, he bellowed when he told him Kaz's orders. I ain't no cheat. Take it up with Kaz, Inej had replied quietly. And keep your voice down, Jesper added, glancing at the tourists and sailors seated at the neighboring tables. Fights were common in the barrel, but not on the floor of the Crow Club. If you had a gripe, you settled it outside, where you didn't risk interrupting the hollowed practice of separating pigeons from their money. Where's Brecker? growled Rojak. I don't know. You always know everything about everything, Rojak sneered, leaning in, the stink of lager and onions on his breath. Isn't that what Dirty Hands pays you for? I don't know where he is or when he's getting back, but I do know you won't want to be here when he does. Give me my check. I'm I'm owed for my last shift. Brecker doesn't owe you anything. He can't even face me. Sends a little girl to give me the boot. Maybe I'll just shake a few coins out of you. He'd reached out to grab her by the collar of her shirt, but she dodged him easily. He fumbled for her again. Out of the corner of her eye, Inej saw Jesper rise from his seat, but she waved him off and slipped her fingers into the brass knuckles she kept on her right hip pocket. She gave Rojak a, swip, a swift crack across the left cheek. His hand flew up to his face. Hey, he said. I didn't hurt you none. It was just words. People were watching now, so she hit him again. Regardless of the Crow Club rules, this took precedence. When Kaz had brought her to the slat, he'd warned her that he wouldn't be able to watch out for her, that she'd have to fend for herself, and she had. It would have been easy enough to turn away when they called her names or siddled up to ask for a cuddle, but do that and soon it would, and soon it was a hand, your blouse, or a try at you against the wall. So she let no insult or no do slide. She'd always struck first and struck hard. Sometimes she even cut them up a bit. It was fatiguing, but nothing was sacred to the Kirch except trade, so she'd gone out of her way to make the risk much higher than reward when it came to disrespecting her. Rojak touched his fingers to the ugly bruise forming on his cheek, looking surprised and a bit betrayed. I thought he we was friendly, he protested. The sad part was that they were. Inej liked Rojak. But right now, he was just a frightened man, looking to feel bigger than someone. Rojak, she said. I've seen you work a deck of cards. You can get a job in almost any den. Go home and be grateful Kaz doesn't take what you owe him out of your hide, hmm? He'd gone, a bit wobbly on his feet, still clutching his cheek like a stun taller, and Jesper had sauntered over. He's right, you know. Kaz should send you to do his dirty work. It's all dirt, dirty work. But we do it just the same, he said with a sigh. You look exhausted. Will you sleep at all tonight? Jesper just winked. Not while the cards are hot. Stay and play a bit. Kaz will stick you. Really, Jesper, she said, pulling up her hood. If I want to watch men dig holes to fall in, I'll find myself a cemetery. Come on, Inej, he called after her as she passed through the big double doors onto the street. Your good luck. Saints, she thought, if he believes that, he really must be desperate. She left her luck behind in a Suli camp on the shores of West Ravka. She doubted she'd see either again. Now Inej left her tiny chamber in the slat and headed downstairs by way of the banisters. There was no reason to cloak her movements here, but silence was a habit, and the stairs tend to squeak like mating mice. When she reached the second floor landing and saw the crowd milling below, she hung back. Kaz had been gone longer than anyone had expected, and as soon as he'd entered the shadowy foyer, he'd been waylaid by people looking to congratulate him on his routing of Giles and asking for news of the black tips. Rumor has it that Giles is already putting together a mob to move on us, said Annika. Let him, rumbled Derricks. I've got an axe handle with his name on it. Giles won't act for a while, said Kaz as he moved down the hall. He doesn't have numbers to face us in the streets, and his coffers are too empty to hire on more hands. Shouldn't you be on your way to the Crow Club? The raised eyebrow was enough to send Annika scurrying away, Derricks on her heels. Others came to offer congratulations or make threats against the black tips. No one went so far as to pat Kaz on the back, though. That was good. That was a good way to lose a hand. Inej knew Kaz would stop to speak to Per Haskell. 
So instead of descending the final flight of stairs, she moved down the hallway. There was a closet there, full of odds and ends, old chairs with broken backs, paint spattered canvas sheeting. Inej moved aside a bucket full of cleaning supplies that she'd placed there precisely because she knew no one in the slat would ever touch it. The grate beneath it offered perfect view of Perhasla's office. She felt slightly guilty for eaves eavesdropping on Kaz, but he was the one who had turned her into a spy. You couldn't train a falcon, then expect it not to hunt. Through the grate, she heard Kaz's knock on Perhasla's door and the sound of his greeting. Back and still breathing, the old man inquired. She could just see him seated in his favorite chair, fiddling with a model ship he'd been building for the better part of a year, a print of larger within arm's reach, as always. We won't have a problem with the Fifth Harbor again. Haskell grunted and returned to his model ship. Close the door. And as she heard a shut, muffling of the sounds from the hallway, she could see the top of Kaz's head. His dark hair was damp. It must have started raining. You should have gotten permission for me to deal with Bolliger, said Haskell. If I talked to you first, the word might have gone out. You think I'd let that happen? Kaz's shoulders lifted. This place is like anything in Ketterdam. It leaks. And as could have sworn he looked directly at the vent when she said it. I don't like it, boy. Big Bolliger was my soldier, not yours. Of course, Kaz said, but they both knew it was a lie. Haskell's dregs were old guard, con men and crooks from another time. Bulger had been one of Kaz's crew, new blood, young and unafraid, maybe too un unafraid. You're smart, Brecker, but you need to learn patience. Yes, sir. The old man barked a laugh. Yes, sir. No, sir, he mocked. I know you're up to something when you start getting polite. Just what have you got brewing? A job, Kaz said. I mean, I may need to be gone for a spell. Big money? Very. Big risk? That too. But you'll get your 20%. You don't make any major moves without my say-so, understood? Kaz must have nodded because Perhaska leaned back in his chair and took a sip of lager. Are we going- are, are, are we to be very rich? Rich as saints with, in crowns of gold. The old man snorted. Long as I don't have to live like one. I'll talk to Pim, Kaz said. He can pick up the slack while I'm gone. And Ash frowned. Just where was Kaz going? He hadn't mentioned any big job to her. And why Pim? The thought shammed her a bit. She could almost hear her father's voice, so eager to be queen of the thieves, and as it was one thing to do her job and do it well, it was quite another to want to succeed at it. She didn't want a permanent place with the dregs. She just wanted to pay off her debts and be free of Ketterdam forever. So why should she care if Kaz chose Pym to run the gang in his absence? Because I'm smarter than Pym, because Kaz trusts me more. But maybe he didn't trust the crew to follow a girl like her, only two years out of the brothels, not even seventeen years old. She wore her sleeves long, and the sheath of her knife mostly hid the scar on the inside of her left forearm, where the menagerie tattoo had once been, but they all knew it was there. Kaz exited Haskell's room, and Inej left her perch to wait for him as he limped his way up the stairs. Rojak, he asked as he passed her, and started up the second flight. Gone, she said, falling in behind him. He put up much of a fight. Nothing I couldn't handle. Not what I asked. He was angry. He may come back around looking for trouble. Never a shortage of that to hand out, Kaz said as they reached the top floor. The attic rooms had been converted into his office and bedroom. She knew all those flights of stairs were brutal on his bad leg, but he seemed to like having the whole floor to himself. He entered the office and, without looking back at her, said, Shut the door. The room was mostly taken up by a makeshift desk, an old ware warehouse door atop, stacked fruit crates, piled high with papers. Some of the floor bosses had started using adding machines, clanking things, crowded with stiff brass buttons and spools of paper. But Kaz did the crow club tallies in his head. He kept books, but only for the sake of the old man and so that he had something to point to when he called someone out for cheating or when he was looking for new investors. That was one of the big changes Kaz had brought to the gang. He'd given ordinary shoekeepers and a, and, a, and a legitimate businessman the chance to buy shares in the Crow Club. At first, they'd been skeptical, sure it was some kind of swindle, but he brought them in with tiny stakes and managed to gather enough capital to purchase the, the dilapidated old building, spruce it up, and get it running. It had paid back for those big early investors. Or so the story went. And Nesh could never be sure which stories about Kaz were true and which were rumors he'd planted to serve his own ends. For all she knew, he'd conned some poor honest trader out of his life savings to make the Crow Club thrive. I've got a job for you, Kaz said as he flipped through the previous day's figures. Each sheet would go on, go into his memory with barely a glance. What would you say to four million Kruga? Money like that is more curse than gift. My little Suli idealist. All you need is a full belly and an open road, he said, the mockery clear in his voice. And an easy heart, Kaz. That was the difficult part. Now he laughed outright as he walked through the door to his tiny bedroom. No hope for that. I'd rather have the cash. Do you want the money or not? You're not in the business of giving gifts. What's the job? An impossible job. Near certain death, terrible odds, and should we scrape it? He paused, fingers on the buttons of his waistcoat, his lift distant, almost dreamy. It was rare that he heard such excitement in his raspy voice. Should we scrape it? She prompted. He grinned at her, his smile sudden and jarring with a thunderclap, his eyes the near black of bitter coffee. We'll be kings and queens, Inej. Kings and queens. Hmm, she said non-committedly. Pretending to examine one of her knives, determined to ignore that grin. Kaz was not a giddy boy smiling and making future plans with her. He was a dangerous player who was always working at an angle. 
Always, she reminded herself firmly, and Edge kept her eyes averted, shuffling the stacks of papers into a pile on a desk as Cass stripped out his vest and shirt. She wasn't sure if she was flattered or insulted. The agent seemed to give a second thought to her presence. How long will we be gone? She asked, darting a glance at him through the open doorway. He was corded muscle, scars, but only two tattoos, a Drake's crow and a cup on his forearm, and above it, a black R on his bicep. She'd never asked him what that meant. It was his hands that drew her attention as she shucked off his leather gloves and dripped the cloth in the wash basket. He only ever removed them in these chambers, and as far as she knew, only in front of her. Whatever affliction he must be hiding, she could see no sign of it, only slender lock pick fingers and shiny rope of scar tissue from some long-ago street fight. A few weeks, maybe a month, he said as he ran the wet cloth under his arms and he heard the planes of his chest water trickling down his torso. For saint's sake, Inej thought as her cheeks heated. She lost most of her modesty during the time with the menagerie, but really, there were limits. What would Kaz say if she suddenly stripped down and started washing herself in front of him? He'd probably tell me not to drip on the desk, she thought with a scowl. A month, she said. Are you sure you would be leaving with the black tips so riled up? This is the right gamble. Speaking of which, I round up Jesper and Muzzin. I want them here by dawn, and I'll need Wyland waiting in the Crow Club tomorrow night. Wyland, if this is for a big job, just do it. And Edge crossed her arms. One minute, he made her blush, and the next, he made her want to commit murder. Are you going to explain any of this when we all meet? He shrugged on a fresh shirt, then hesitated as he fastened the collar. This isn't an assignment, Inej. It's a job for you to take or to leave, as you see fit. An alarm bell rang inside her. She emerged herself every day on the streets of Barrel. He'd murdered for the dregs, stolen, brought down bad men and good, and Kaz had never hinted that any of the assignments were less than a command to be obeyed. This was the price that she'd agreed to when Per Haskell had purchased her contract and liberated her from the menagerie. So what was different about this job? Kaz finished with his buttons, pulled on a charcoal waistcoat, and tossed her something. It flashed in the air, and she caught it with one hand. When she opened her fist, it was a massive ruby tie pin, circled by golden laurel leaves. Fence it, Kaz said. Whose is it? Ours now. Whose was it? Kaz stayed quiet. He picked up his coat, using a brush to clean the dried mud from it. Someone who should have thought better before he had you jumped. Jumped? You heard me. Someone got the drop on you? He looked at her and nodded. Unease snaked through her and twisted into an ancient, ru anxious rustling coil. No one got the better of Kaz. He was the toughest, scariest thing walking in the alleys of the barrel. She relied on it. So did he. It won't happen again, he promised. Kaz pulled on a clear pair of gloves, snapped up his walking stick, and headed for the door. I'll be back in a few hours. Move the decapel we lifted from Van X house to the vault. I think it's rolled up under my bed. Oh, and put an order for a new hat. Please? Kaz heaved a sigh and braced himself for three painful flights of stairs. He looked over his shoulder and said, Please, my darling Inej, treasure of my heart, won't you do me the honor of acquiring me a new hat? Inej cast a meaningful glance at his cane. Have a long trip down, she said, and then left onto the banister, sliding from one flight to the next, slick as butter in a pan.